Yes, it's really me. I know it's been some months since I last put out a video on this channel, so let me give you a quick update. Back in February when the pandemic hit, I thought it was gonna be a couple of weeks tops until I could hit the streets of San Francisco again. But now, it's been almost a full year since everything either semi or all the way shut down. And it's been kind of tough to make videos of the quality that I want. So aside from making this filmed in San Francisco series, I'm taking a small hiatus from travel content on this channel. However, I haven't stopped filming. So if you want to see more of my content, hop on over to my new channel, Epic Eats, which is focused on fabulous foods from the Bay Area. Now back to our regular programming. <laughs> going to kick off this girl power edition of the Made in San Francisco series with one of the most badass female villains ever to grace the big screen. Sharon Stone's portrayal of crime novelist Catherine Trammell in 1992's Basic Instinct, a controversial thriller about a mysterious murder that follows the plotline of one of Trammell's best-selling novels, putting her squarely in the hot seat of potential suspects. Trammell is richly complex. She's smart, charismatic, promiscuous, and utterly psychopathic. Michael Douglas also stars as police detective Nick Curran, who starts off investigating the novelist, but then gets manipulated by her down Alice's mad rabbit hole. As is de rigueur for crime thrillers, the movie opens up with a murder scene. A famous rock star has been brutally stabbed with an ice pick. His Lux pad located IRL in Pacific Heights Billionaire's Row, which is known for its 20 plus million dollar mansions owned by tech CEOs and socialites. The majority of the film takes place over two fictional homes. Trammell's fictional main address at 162 Division Darrow would put it squarely in the Upper Haight, another prestigious neighborhood where actor Danny Glover and musician Graham Nash used to live. But the actual filming location is a mansion back at Billionaire's Row in Pacific Heights, right next to the Lion Street Steps and the Presidio. And the other fictional location is Catherine's seaside vacation home at Stinson Beach. Cedar 1402. Located in Marin, across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. For this set, production used a rental villa in an exclusive neighborhood of Carmel-by-the-Sea, where Clint Eastwood lives. The film's director, Paul Verhoeven, was immensely influenced by another great San Francisco thriller, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, and there are all sorts of references to that movie throughout. The musical score, the selection and styling of Sharon Stone's character, who in this classic scene is eerily reminiscent of Kim Novak, in an encounter that Curran has with Trammell outside her friend Hazel Dobkin's house in Mill Valley. Side note, the house used in this shot is actually located in Petaluma, Sonoma County, about 30 minutes north of Mill Valley. You could see St. Vincent's Catholic Church behind him, which parallels this scene in Vertigo with St. Paulus German Lutheran Church behind Jimmy Stewart when he follows Kim Novak to an old mansion in the Western Edition. And the stairway walk up to Nick's apartment at 1158 Montgomery Street in North Beach looks eerily similar, cinematography wise, to Hitchcock's old San Juan Bautista bell tower where the tragic events of Vertigo occur. Well, not as subtle as Vertigo, both have the same mind-bending plot twists and turns that will have you on the edge of your seat throughout. Shifting gears to some lighter, more comedic fare, 1992 was also a banner year for strong female protagonists. One of the top 10 grossing films was Sister Act, starring Whoopi Goldberg as Reno Lounge singer Dolores Van Cartier, whose ties with the mob force her into witness protection as Sister Mary Clarence at a convent in San Francisco. Maggie Smith, best known for her roles as the Dowager Countess Grantham in Downtown Abbey and as Professor McGonagall in the Harry Potter series, plays the Mother Superior. The fictional St. Catherine's Convent is actually St. Paul's Catholic Church in Noe Valley. And here's a fun fact, Noe Valley is actually a pretty upscale neighborhood in San Francisco, but the script called for a seedier locale, so production crews had to trash the neighborhood, which surprised some locals who didn't realize there was filming going on. The majority of the film takes place inside the convent, which then should have rooms for the nuns to both live and work. However, St. Paul's is mostly just a church nave with a school in the back. 
So the vast majority of the interior shots had to take place at the First United Methodist Church in Hollywood, Los Angeles. A couple of scenes were done at St. Paul's, including this scene here, where the sisters are fixing up an old VW bug. And this finale, when the Pope comes to hear the choir sing, I will follow him in the main nave. In 1993, Sister Act Two returned to San Francisco, this time at the old City College of San Francisco campus in Civic Center. The sequel wasn't close to being as successful as the original, but it did well enough that they're now making a Sister Act Three due to be released on Disney+. Plus. Of course, not all strong female characters have the forcefulness and in-your-face of Catherine Trammell and Dolores Van Cartier. Some have the quiet strength of still waters running deep, like the eight lead characters in Oliver Stone's 1993 The Joy Luck Club, written by another powerful female, Oakland native Amy Tan, who gets a cameo in the first five seconds of the opening sequence. The film focuses on two generations of Chinese American women who struggle with resolving the id of self-desires and happiness with the expectations of filial piety and family duty. There's the main mother-daughter pair, Su Yuan and Jun Wu, played by Ming-Na Wen, who is best known for her roles as Melinda May in ABC's Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and as Fennec Shand in Disney's The Mandalorian. Best frenemies, Lindo and Waverly Zhang, the well-to-do Ying Ying and Lena St. Clair, and finally, An Mei and Rose Shu, played by Rosalind Chow of Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Deep Space Nine fame. With eight characters all telling their backstories, spanning from San Francisco to China and over a century of time, the only way to reduce the complexity of the novel was to shoot only in San Francisco and fake the China scenes. There's this scene where a young Waverly wins a chess competition at Horace Mann School in the Mission District, and then gets annoyed about it when her mom brags about it to neighbors at Waverly Place in Chinatown. Fun fact, Tan named a character after the street, and not the other way around. And Horace Mann shows up again for June's botched piano recital, Falali Gardens in Woodside, a wealthy town just west of Stanford University where actress Michelle Pfeiffer resides, is also smartly repurposed in several of the scenes. For Ying Ying St. Clair's Shanghai flashbacks, the mansion's ballroom doubles as a 20s Western-influenced dance hall. This is where Ying Ying meets her first husband, who is charismatic, but is also abusive and a philanderer, which causes her to have a psychotic breakdown and have disassociative episodes. The mansion's entrance is used as a backdrop for An Mei's childhood home, when she goes to live with her mother, who's been taken in as the fourth wife, or concubine, to a wealthy Chinese merchant. And the Garnum Pool becomes the Jordan backyard, when An Mei's daughter, Rose, is introduced to the powerful, yet snobby, future in-laws. The next film, I had to think long and hard about whether to include. But in the end, I had to give tribute to lead actor Kate Blanchett for being one of the most celebrated girl power actresses of our time, and also for her nuanced performance of Jasmine French. As an aside, she won an Oscar for this role and is also an active supporter of women's rights all around the world. Blue Jasmine is writer-director Woody Allen's retelling of A Streetcar Named Desire, but set in San Francisco. French is a Manhattan socialite who becomes destitute after her husband is arrested and then commits suicide in jail for a Bernie Madoff-esque Ponzi scheme that has allowed them to live large in the Big Apple. She goes to live with her working class sister, Ginger, arriving at her Van Ness Mission District apartment, penniless, but with five Louis Vuitton bags filled to the brim with designer clothing. Van Ness is a pretty busy commercial street, so in this scene, you'll see the Volvo dealership right across the street, and then above that, the on-ramp to the 101 freeway. After some trademark Alan S. bumbling, Jasmine finally gets the key and lets herself into Ginger's apartment the interior of which is filmed at a completely different apartment on 20th Street in the trendier Valencia area of Mission District. There were so many awesome scenes of the city by the bay that it was, quite frankly, very hard to choose which ones to feature in this video. So here's a bunch of fun ones selected specifically for film tourism photo ops. Ginger and her boyfriend Chili take Jasmine out for drinks at the ramp in Mission Bay. Stop in here for a photo op at the intersection of Taylor and Green with Alcatraz in the background. The exterior of the dental office where Jasmine works briefly as a receptionist. 
drinks with said dentist, Dr. Flicker, at Abu Zam Zam in Haight-Ashbury, and Ginger and Al's lunch date at Ocean Beach. Okay, moving on. Heroines come in all shapes, sizes, ages, and media. Even the animated kind. In 2015, Pixar released Inside Out, starring Riley Anderson, an 11-year-old girl who moves from Minnesota to San Francisco when her dad gets a job at a tech startup. Along for the ride are her cast of feelings, who are about to take Riley on a serious adventure. Fun fact, Riley is modeled after director Pete Docter's daughter Ellie, and the film is loosely based off of his own personal experiences moving to San Francisco for his job at Pixar. The interesting thing about trying to identify locations in an animated flick is that the set designers take artistic license, and so it's not 100% a match. So where applicable, I will try to point out the inspirations instead. The film starts with the family driving into San Francisco across the Golden Gate Bridge from the Marin side. You can see here when they emerge from the Robin Williams Bridge. The family arrives into their new neighborhood, which is based off of Hyde Street in Russian Hill. According to Pixar artists, Riley's new home is located near Hyde and Green, off a side alley, and so this is their interpretation of that intersection. They arrive at their new house, which has an address of 21 Royal Street. There's no such address in the real San Francisco. Instead, this is a nod to the 21 Royal dining experience at Disneyland, which was formerly the Sleeping Beauty suite, and costs a swank 15k per head. Riley settles uneasily into the strangeness of SF culture. Her new school is also fabricated, but it's based off of three architectural gems in the city. The Marina Middle School in the Marina District, the Francisco Middle School in North Beach, and the James Lick Middle School in Noe Valley. Her classmates are urban, funky, and so mature. She has a bad tryout for her favorite sport, hockey, at an arena located in the Presidio on the top of the old historic airplane hangars. Even pizza, which she normally loves, is different in San Francisco. Personally, I think the broccoli pizza slices are fantastic at Arizmendi Co-op in Emeryville, where Pixar employees lunch, and which is also the basis for the Yeast of Eden pizzeria in the movie. But you can't always get it. They have a different pizza flavor every day. Towards the end of the movie, Riley becomes so homesick that she decides to run away and take a Transway bus all the way back to Minnesota. This is a nod to the old Transbay Terminal that served as the transportation hub for the city before Salesforce Tower was built. The building in the movie, however, is not the current structure, which is still there. Instead, it's a mix of the original 1939 terminal and an Art Deco building that stands at Howard and Van Ness and is currently a BMW dealership. And from Pixar in Emeryville to the north, all the way down to Monterey in the south, I'm gonna end this video with one of my current all-time favorite TV shows, HBO's Big Little Lies, with its powerhouse ensemble female cast of Nicole Kidman, Reese Witherspoon, Shailene Woodley, Laura Dern, Zoe Kravitz, and Meryl Streep. The opening sequence is just iconic, with shots of scenic Highway 1 and Bixby Creek Bridge, styled to the folksy, melancholy theme song, Cold Little Heart. The show has done an awesome job of covering a ton of Monterey real estate in just two seasons. There are some of the more popular touristy spots, like the famous Monterey Bay Aquarium, where Woodley's character Jane takes her son Ziggy often for outings during season one, and eventually works there during season two. The Blues Blue Cafe, where Jane and Madeline, played by Reese, and Celeste, played by Kidman, hang out for some coffee and gossip after dropping off their kids at school, was shot at the Luca Trattoria on Fisherman's Wharf for background plates. The scenes were actually shot in a studio in LA, since coastal weather can be quite fickle, with fog, coastal winds, rain, all disrupting a shoot, and then you've got the pier, which makes it really difficult for filming. The famous Whaler's Cove at Point Lobo State Natural Reserve near Carmel is 
very popular with kayakers because it sits right on top of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, where you can see a ton of sea life. This serves as the picturesque backdrop for a kayaking adventure with Celeste, Jane, their kids, and Jane's love interest, Corey Brockfield, in the episode, Kill Me. I love, though, that the show also introduces us to some hidden Monterey gems. The glamorous hotel where Jane experiences a very traumatic event is the Monterey Tides Hotel, with its chic modern decor, impeccable service, and most importantly, oceanfront real estate. You can actually fall asleep to the sound of the waves. Lover's Point Beach in nearby Pacific Grove, which seems to be the neighborhood's hangout spot. This is where Ed and Nathan, Madeline's husband and her ex, have their little shouting match. Jane and her son Ziggy picnic in the episode Push Comes to Shove, and Jane and Celeste have a serious tete-a-tete -tete about a classroom bullying problem in the season one finale, You Get What You Need. And finally, Madeline and Ed try to salvage their marriage and attend a couple's retreat at the Healing Institute in the episode Kill Me. In real life, this is the Seven Coves, a luxury compound of rental villas, which boasts five separate houses spread across four acres of land with about a thousand feet of epic coastline. This also happens to be the property that served as Catherine Trammell's beachside vacation home at the top of this video in Basic Instinct. You know I always like to bring these episodes full circle. Shall we put a fork in it? I think this video is done. And it's gotten dark outside. As long as this installment was, there were so many great filming locations that I just could not include. What were some of your favorites from these movies that I just had to cut out? Leave me a comment below. Stay tuned for the next episode in the series, working title, Young Blood, AKA Young Adult Movies and TV Shows. And that's a wrap.